Mr. Telvi, unfortunately, in Latin America, the corona crisis is not the only area of a humanitarian disaster. One of them in Venezuela well predated COVID-19 and is one that was important to you as a presidential candidate for the Partido Colorado in last year's election and remains, it appears, a priority of the, of the foreign ministry. I wanted to talk to you for a bit about how you're approaching what is a substantial change to Uruguayan foreign policy in this transition. You talked earlier of continuity in Uruguayan policy and that it's a very yeah. predictable country. I think on Venezuela, though, we are seeing a significant shift in the attitude, an embrace of Luis Almagro and the Organization of American States, an Uruguayan whose approach was not always embraced by the Frente Amplio government that preceded you. What has been your approach to Venezuela and how is it different than Uruguay's before you came into the foreign ministry? Yeah. Um, Benjamin, we are more, much more about continuity than change. Uh, and, and with respect to Venezuela, it's an area in which there is headline change, a lot of continuity under the headline. What's the headline change? We unequivocally uh, say in no uncertain terms that there's nothing like a democracy in Venezuela. There's no democracy in Venezuela. Uh, there is systematic violation of human rights in Venezuela. And we say that. We uh, want the Venezuelan people to be able to live once again uh, in a country where democracy prevails, rule of law prevails, and where people are free. Uh, and we are working uh, uh, towards that goal. But at the same time, we want to preserve us, uh, ourselves. And I think we are going to be basically the only ones in the region as an honest broker, because it is clear that uh, the Maduro regime uh, holds power, controls the territory. So it is clear that this, if we are going to have a peaceful transition towards democracy, at some point, we are going to have two parties at the table. And, uh, and therefore, we are working together with our European friends um, within the uh, international contact group uh, to try to unify all the dispersed initiatives that we have today vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela so that the international community can speak with a single voice and exert both moral and uh, other kinds of pressure towards facilitating, towards creating the conditions for uh, what's going to be a very difficult negotiation towards democratization in Venezuela. So I think that the, the headline, yes, we unequivocally condemn the Maduro regime, but at the same time, we are preserving the institution, institutional base and platform upon which Uruguay is working towards democratization in Venezuela and that was created by the previous government. So continuity and change, uh, a lot of continuity and uh, also headline change, which is not, although it is headline, it's not minor. No, no, it's not minor, but I do agree with you. I think, you know, those that were critical of the last Uruguayan government's approach, its reluctance to label the Venezuelan regime as, as autocratic and dictatorial, its reluctance to emphasize the human rights abuses, even, you know, those critics of Uruguay admired the effort to promote dialogue in many cases, and this honest broker role you're talking about. I wonder if, if you might comment on the, you know, the Lima group, the United States, other key actors in Venezuela, and whether you think they're as committed as they should be in promoting a negotiated solution. The United States, for example, has focused very much on sanctions, most recently criminally indicting the president of Venezuela um, and other senior figures, the head of the Supreme Court, the head of the military, and has been criticized for not using that leverage to promote negotiations or not even being interested anymore in bringing the parties together. Do you feel like the other key actors in the international community outside Uruguay and the European Union 
are sufficiently committed to negotiations? I do. I do, Benjamin. The last uh, U.S. initiative uh, for uh, a roadmap towards democratization in Venezuela, while at the same time uh, lifting sanctions as we progress, were promising. We actually supported the initiative together with our friends at the, in the European Union. Uh, let me be frank. Uh, uh, we would have liked this initiative to be a collective initiative uh, rather than a unilateral initiative that we that others would support and sign. Uh, but having said this, I think that the last roadmap that the U.S. presented presents an opportunity that it's political, that it's peaceful, that it's uh, uh, reasonable. Uh, and uh, promising in terms of um, actually uh, presenting a feasible roadmap. Uh, and it has been accepted generally by both the International Contact Group and the parties of the, of the Lima Group. Um, we still feel that we should try to coordinate among these groups. There are also other groups, the Swedish Initiative, uh, in order to promote a collective roadmap that is pre-approved by all the, the parties in question. And that I think would give any initiative um, um, uh, more uh, leverage uh, and weight than if it is seen as a simply unilateral initiative. Uh, on the on the part of the U.S., we said this very frankly to the State Department, and, and have no problem in saying the same thing publicly. It's a good initiative. It would have been better if it would have been a collective initiative, sponsored by by everybody before presenting it. Let me ask you about Mercosur. There's great anxiety right now among those who watch this customs union, given the ideological differences between Argentina. And, and basically everyone else in Mercosur, in Paraguay, in, in Brazil right now, and in Uruguay, when it comes to free trade agreements. There was a fear of this after the Argentine election, but it would became more explicit when the Argentine government said that it would continue to be a part of the talks with the European Union, but no longer participate in any of the other free trade agreement discussions. Um, and there are several, particularly in, in East Asia. You came out very clearly and said these conversations would go forward. And it left some questions about what that means for the future of Mercosur. This is not the first time this has occurred with Uruguay. Even under the first Tabaré Vázquez presidency, there was some talk about deals outside Mercosur for Uruguay, even maybe with the United States. What is the future of Mercosur? And what would it mean if one of the key members is no longer participating in free trade negotiations? Again, uh, Benjamin, we have to go here beyond the headline. Uh, to what it is exactly happening. Uh, this is, I think, a very strong commitment on the part of the four countries of Mercosur. Uh, we want to preserve Mercosur as a brand. It is, we have a lot of interested parties in negotiating uh, free trade agreements with Mercosur. We are actually finishing with the European Union and EFTA. We are negotiating deals with Canada, uh, Lebanon, Singapore, Korea, and uh, in the pipeline there, we have Vietnam and Indonesia. So, so, so after 20 years, the Mercosur is, I think, coming to its original uh, goal, which is we are an open, we were seeking an open regionalism in which the four of us together are stronger as a market, more attractive, and stronger to negotiate teams uh, with the rest of the world. So that's the process in which we are. Uh, so we want to preserve the brand. Now, the different countries have different interests in terms of the speed at which we want to negotiate. So what we are trying to achieve, and this is a very sensible proposition, is what we did with the European Union. And, the, and uh, uh, the negotiation part of the deals allows for different 
uh, speech. I mean, and 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 uh, for example, you can have uh, Argentina can have different uh, lists of exceptions than the ones Uruguay has. Maybe we have less sensitivities because we are smaller. The Argentina may have a different calendar of tariff reduction, more protracted than the one Uruguay has, or Brazil has, or Paraguay. So within the negotiation, we can have sufficient flexibility to allow for differences in the national interests. And after the negotiation is concluded, and the European Union, again, is a very good example, once the agreement is signed and it is approved by the European Parliament, then the agreement starts effectively working once the parliament of each of the countries individually approves it. So if Uruguay approves the treaty, link, it starts to, to effectively to work, in, even if the other members did not ratify the treaty in their policy. So it's flexibility ex ante during the negotiation, flexibility ex post to allow for national differences uh, and the national interests, but keeping the four together glued in negotiating uh, uh, jointly. So this is the way uh, I think all the countries in Mercosur are, are going, and, and we hope that this combination of uh, together, but with flexibility, will allow uh, for Mercosur to uh, to pursue uh, these agreements and at the same time remain remain together. I, I wanted to, before we end, just ask more broadly about Uruguay-Argentina relations. Um, you know, the cultures are, are so similar, the history, the, you know, the accent, the, the embrace of, of tango and asado, that, you know, casual observers would think these are, of course, you know, brother-sister nations. In, in reality, there have been difficult moments, including under the last Peronist government in Argentina. There was an environmental dispute that went to international arbitration. There were some disagreements among personalities of the leadership. The president of Argentina now is known as a pragmatic figure, um, including on foreign policy. But there have been certain moments that have made um, some observers question whether there's a bit of an ideology as well, an interest in the Grupo Puebla, um, an embrace of the Chilean uh, leftist parties that, that upset their relations with Chile briefly, um, an embrace of Lula that has upset the current president, Jair Bolsonaro, of Brazil. What do you see in terms of Uruguay-Argentina relations? Um. Let me say this, Benjamin. Um, Argentina is our big brother. Uh, we share cultural traits. Uh, we have a very different institutional uh, uh, history. Uh, but um, let me say that so far, uh, the, the relationship with Argentina uh, has been uh, very, very cooperative. Actually, uh, let me say that, that Foreign Minister Solar has been extremely receptive in, 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 in helping us in humanitarian operations. I mean, in places where we actually had no possibility whatsoever of repatriating our nationals, uh, and Argentina had flights, they always made a small uh, uh, slot for bringing in Uruguayans, allowing us then to pick them up in the airport in spite of the compulsory quarantine and bring them back home. So I would say that, that there may be differences which are understandable and, 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 and uh, manageable. We respect uh, that we are different countries and different governments and we might have different positions vis-a-vis -vis certain topics. But so far, I would say that the relation has been uh, characterized by, by, by a strong degree of, of cooperation and, and very kind uh, and, and, and fluid, fluent relationships. So, so we are very uh, optimistic that we will preserve, in spite of some differences, we will preserve that uh, in the foreseeable future. 
Foreign Minister Ernesto Talvi, you've been so generous sharing your time and your insights with us. Thank you so much. We will hold you to your pledge to come see us in person when you get to Washington. Congratulations on all your success. It's been a, a very challenging and interesting start to your time in the foreign ministry and you've clearly risen to the occasion. Okay, thanks to you, uh, uh, Benjamin. And uh, uh, well, um, my best to everybody in DC. I was part of the community there when I was at Brookings and uh, there is a, a, always a, a small part of me, in spite of all that is happening, that misses the former life as a, as a public policy academic. So it was a pleasure to be here with you. Excellent. Minister, thank you so much. That truly, that was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Let's please stay in touch.